Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Ellen Nakashima, a national security reporter with the Washington Post, and I'm excited to be moderating this program. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Frank Figluzzi, a former assistant director of the FBI's counterintelligence division and author of the fantastic new book, The FBI Way, Inside the Bureau's Code of Excellence. Frank served with the FBI in field offices in Atlanta, San Francisco, Miami, and Cleveland, and at headquarters in Washington, DC. He's worked public corruption, foreign terrorism, and counterintelligence. Significantly, he also investigated other FBI agents and supervisors as head of the Office of Professional Responsibility. Now he's sharing the core values that undergird what is arguably the premier law enforcement organization in the world. He calls it the FBI way. He's condensed them into what he calls the seven C's, code, conservancy, clarity, consequences, compassion, credibility, and consistency. I'm looking forward to hearing how Frank thinks the FBI lived up to these seven C's or sometimes fell short of these values. If you're watching along with us please, and have questions for Frank, please put them in the text chat on YouTube and we'll be getting to them later in the program. Thank you, Frank, for joining us. Ellen, my thanks is to you for agreeing to moderate this. I'm I'm honored that uh, we could do this together, and I'm excited about being back at least virtually in my old stomping grounds of San Francisco, where I was an FBI supervisor for three years. Terrific. Well, Frank, you know, the events of the last four years have led a number of former public officials who ordinarily would have kept silent to write books and speak out, former Director Jim Comey among them. What prompted you to write this book? Well, first, I have to be honest and say that what got me over the hurdle of saying I would never write the book um, is the fact that the institution that I loved and dedicated 25 years to had been bashed for four years. And that's okay. Criticism of the Bureau will happen on a daily basis. But for me, it meant that the success of the mission, the FBI's ability to get the cooperation of a trusting public was being negatively impacted. And for me, it was all about that mission and the success of it. So this book says, look, not only is what you're hearing from some corners not accurate, but the the difference about this book is it puts up the, the Bureau as a leadership model, a template about how to perform with high degree of excellence under high stress. And you don't have to spend 25 years in the FBI to glean some of those lessons. I've distilled them down into what I call, as you said, the seven C's. Well, the FBI and its leadership role has come under some scrutiny in recent weeks. I mean, your timing for this book was impeccable, right? Your book tour began in the days after the big January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. Let's let's do a, what you call a hot wash there. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what happened. Uh, why, why didn't the FBI couldn't they have seen this coming or better prevented the assault? Tell us what you think went wrong. Yeah, I've been calling this uh, insurrection, Ellen, not so much a failure of intelligence, but rather a failure to act upon available intelligence. No one can claim ignorance on the insurrection. Even armchair intelligence analysts at home were seeing this play out on social media. We were seeing even within private and public domain talk of, quote, overwhelming the Capitol Police, for for example. So we learned in the aftermath quickly that the FBI did provide intelligence concerns about violence to the Capitol Police, to the entire Capitol region. We've learned even that internally, the Capitol Police Intelligence Unit prepared a very concerning intelligence assessment for their own use. So now we have lots and lots of questions and very few answers about why wasn't this prevented? Um, and it's layered and nuanced. Um, who was calling the shots, if at all? What higher levels came in and said, we're going to have this insufficient security posture? We need a lot of answers. 
Well, did the FBI live up to its code in handling the intelligence that it had? Should it have pressed harder? Well, here's a, yeah, a great a great question because on the one hand, this is a teachable moment for people like me to to educate the public that the FBI is not in the building security business. They aren't they aren't security guards or uh, at buildings. However, I'm very uncomfortable with an FBI stance that says, well, we provided our intelligence bulletins and advisories and, you know, have a nice day. Good luck with that. I, I don't buy that either. So I'm sensing after 25 years in that organization that other factors came into play. And I'm very concerned if, in fact, political factors and pressure and influence, perhaps from an acting attorney general, perhaps even from the White House, may have may have impacted the degree to which the FBI could step in and say, the, uh, bad things about to happen, and we're not comfortable with the security posture. Wow, I mean, you're you're alluding to you know degree of political interference there, and uh, maybe some cultural uh, impediments there that showed that people weren't resisting properly to that. I'm, getting at? I, I am. I'm also. Let, let's not. Um, let's also not es- escape or overlook the obvious. You know, as they teach medical students, sometimes a headache is just a headache. And in this case, I see a lack of legislation, a lack of investigative tools. I see some very valid civil liberties and privacy concerns where FBI lawyers and DOJ lawyers stop agents from looking at social media posts that might be simply an exercise of free speech. I also hear from agents even um, even this last week saying, look, we, we have tremendous challenges in terms of differentiating between an aspirational post, some guy eating potato chips on his couch, and then a guy who's going to act out and execute violence. It is a daunting, daunting challenge, especially while you're trying to protect free speech. So let's step back for a moment. You're talking about uh, a larger question of domestic violent extremism, something that's been with us. It's been a, it's, it's been a phenomenon, a scourge for decades. You, you yourself covered it, I think, in your earlier years. You were investigating the Ku Klux Klan. Tell me what's new here? What's different? This has been around for years. What, if anything, is different about this uh, violent extremism around this time? Is it social media? Is it the fragmentation of groups? What do you see that's different? Yeah, there, there's two major differences, and you hit on one of them. There's no question that the role of social media was enormous in facilitating this with a speed with which we've never seen in our history before. Um, There's a huge difference between a Klan meeting in the 1960s in the back of a gas station and and 100,000 people all posting plans and intentions and an echo chamber that moves at the speed of a tweet. Um, Huge difference. And we're way behind the curve legislatively, um, in the corporate big tech world and in law enforcement on this. The, the, the free speech aspect is, is almost, I, I don't want to say it's humorous, but when you're talking about people posting by the hundreds of thousands their intentions to, to kill the Speaker of the House or whatever, we're, we're way beyond free, free speech concerns. That, that's not free speech. We're, we're into facilitating engaging in violence on a, on a massive scale. The other different thing about this is we've never had a president who actually served as a kind of insider in chief, radicalizer in chief. And when you have that as a bully pulpit, you you have radicalization on steroids. You alluded to some of the challenges that the FBI and other law enforcement organizations face in combating this, especially far right extremism. yeah, when, and you were also uh, active at post 9-11. After 9-11, the FBI gained new tools to fight foreign terrorism. And with the designation of foreign terrorist organizations overseas, law enforcement has tools to, to surveil, wiretap, investigate some of these groups that aren't available to them for domestic groups. Can you talk a little bit about that as a challenge? And do you see any and way around it or through it. Yeah, we, we, we need to have this discussion as a nation and, and I, I want to see this play out uh, on Capitol Hill as well. So look, the good news is we've had, 
we have not had a, a terrorism attack, serious, significant terrorist attack on U.S. soil since 9-11. There's a reason for that. The reason for that is the FBI is at war every single day and has the tools necessary. So here's what I mean by that. Not only is there an international terrorism law that if, you found, if you're found to break it, sends you away for 20 years to life, but, but also with that package comes the ability to designate groups and organizations like Al-Qaeda, like ISIS, like Boko Haram. And when that happens, and you even trip into that group and become associated with those groups, you get covered like a blanket by the FBI, and it becomes a preventive, proactive posture. So, for example, I talk about the El Paso Walmart shooter, a white kid from Texas in a chat room talking about hurting brown invaders, the language of the president. If you switch that young man over to Islam, and you make his cause violent jihad and killing infidels, and he's associated with Al-Qaeda or Boko Haram, you have the FBI with court-ordered wiretaps on that chat room, informants in the chat room, undercover agents will bump him at the supermarket. They will likely prevent him from doing anything. We have nothing like that on the domestic terror side. Now, Ellen, I I'm well aware of the very valid concerns about quote unquote, spying on Americans for ideology and not for violence. And I'm very aware of the potential abuses of designating groups. Look, we just had a president who tweeted one day, I hereby declare Antifa, a domestic terror organization. There could be abuses to that if, if we actually had a way of designating a domestic terror organization. And, and what I'm afraid of, Ellen, is that we automatically jump to the, oh, you want to spy on Americans discussion. And it, it, it stops us from just passing a law against domestic terrorism. And so I, mm -hmm. I'm saying let, let, let's, let's put the, the designation of groups aside. Yes. Let's, let's put that aside and say, do, does everyone agree that when, when, we are, when someone robs a bank, we don't arrest them for trespass in the bank. We arrest them for bank robbery, a far more serious crime against the government, by the way, for federally insured monies. Mm -hmm. And when someone commits insurrection at the Capitol, we arrest them for trespass, assault, theft of Nancy Pelosi's podium. It's time to recognize it as a much more serious crime. Let's call it what it is. Let's call it domestic terrorism. Let's have a law against it. And let's avoid the uh, First Amendment pitfalls, I guess, of designating, going the designation route for domestic groups. I think, I, I think baby steps for now, Ellen. And I, I have to tell you, even having a law to point to changes the dynamic so much. When an FBI agent walks into a U.S. attorney's office and says, hey, I have a, I have a potential domestic terrorism case for you. I, I can charge domestic terrorism. That, that prosecutor sits up and pays attention. When an FBI agent walks in and says, I, I've got an assault case or a trespass case, or I've even got guy, a guy assembling bomb making equipment. Eh, I have that all the time. So, you know, let's treat it seriously. Let's get prosecutive attention on it and, and let's put people on notice. Look, even today, as we speak, Ellen, the Department of Homeland Security has just issued what? Right. A domestic terrorism advisory about our own people. They're calling it a terrorism threat. Why don't we have a law against it? Right. I think they're warning about potential violence stirred by people who are agitated by uh, President Biden's election and inauguration. So, you know, um, there were also in recent days protests of, in, in Portland. You, 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 you saw those, you heard about those. There's been some, you know, smashing of windows or some violence on the left. Is that not also a, a threat to, uh, to, to public security? What do you think about, about the threat of violent extremism on the left? I, I am um, I am neutral. I'm a neutral law enforcement officer, meaning I've I, in my career, I've investigated and arrested people of all stripes, colors and political persuasions. And if you're a threat, you're a threat. But I I want to I want to say a couple of things about that. One, we are going to have there, there is a criminal element in this society, no matter what we do. And, and we need to distinguish between a criminal element and an organized, coordinated group 
that actually plans violence for ideological purposes. I'm right back to the definition of terrorism, which mm -hmm. is the use of force or violence to coerce or intimidate a government or civilian population for the purpose of advancing a political or social objective. I think the latest that I'm hearing out of violence in Portland is it's coming awfully close to that definition. It is, mm -hmm. hey, we don't care who the president is. We want to send a message politically and socially that things need to change. That sounds a lot like terrorism to me as well. And so here's what I say. Um, I find it ironic. I, I go on, I do a lot of television and some of some of the TV show hosts, they their heads exploded when they started shouting about the insurrection that the FBI should have been all over this, should have prevented it, right? But the moment you ask them, so so you're okay with say designating groups and organizations, terror groups? Absolutely. So so you'd be okay with folk designating a group in Portland, a terrorist group, if they're on the far left? No. Oh, okay. So we, we've got to work through that because violence can come from all sectors if we're not careful. Yes. Maybe it's an issue of criminalizing the, the action and the violence and not the ideology. Right? I agree. I agree. Uh, there has also been criticism about the contrast in the heavy-handed way in which law enforcement have handled Black Lives Matter protests and then the relatively hands-off approach taken by the Capitol Police in Jan January 6th. Is that criticism valid uh, or is there a double standard? What's behind the disparity? Yeah, you can't you can't be a credible law enforcement professional anymore and and pretend that the disparity in treatment and security posture doesn't exist. A true security professional understands this. Your planning and your security posture has to be intelligence-driven and risk-based. So let's look at this disparity. Insurrection at the Capitol, all kinds of intelligence, even written assessments saying violence is coming soon and even on this day. That's a high threat risk based on intelligence. What was the security posture? Wholly insufficient. A bunch of police officers in their normal daily uniforms, no tactical teams, no hard perimeter. Let's go to the, the riots over the summer, Black Lives Matter, excessive use of police force. And what was the, the intelligence? Um, there's going to be some a bunch of peaceful protesters who are upset about police uh, conduct. Okay. What's the posture? Riot teams, DHS agents on the ground, um, uh, rubber bullets, pepper spray bombs, and so I see a disparity there. And I have to ask the question, if the folks at the, at the Capitol building on January 6th were a different color or a different religion like Islam, would we have seen actual uh, shooting, aggressive response, putting down that, that riot? I think the answer is yes. Oh. You know, Frank, as, as head of the OPR, uh, you investigated cases of you know, other cases of agents um, impropriety. Did you s come across any cases of agents improperly sympathizing with, say, white supremacists or domestic violent extremists? No, I'm, I'm actually pleased to say in large part, and I write about this in the book, in large part because of the vetting process um, that the FBI expends tremendous resources on, not only on who they bring in the door, but then mm -hmm. vetting them continuously throughout their career. A lot of a lot of the folks joining us today, Helen, have no idea that every five years, at a minimum, FBI employees, all of them, are repolygraphed and reinvestigated as if they were getting hired all over again, including not just a credit and criminal check, but knocking on your neighbor's doors, your the, the, a financial mm -hmm. analysis, um, your social media posts. This is an ongoing and expensive operation. So I'm glad to say that, no, I've, that I've not encountered that. The, there have been random, um, random comments, misjudgments, um, troubling statements, you know, off, off record about something. And, and those people are slammed hard for that and made examples of. That's the kind of thing I write about in my book in terms of preserving your core values as an organization, as a team as a nation. There's a question from the audience that's sort of related to this. It's, it is, are you concerned about how white the FBI is? It seems like it's time for diversification. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned on, on a couple of levels. And, and, and this thing, th this issue simply 
we, the Bureau seems unable to get out, out of head of this. I, I've been talking about this and, and the Bureau has been talking about it openly uh, ever since I joined the FBI. And, and that is that from a success standpoint, let's put aside the reality that diversity actually works, that, that it, it brings different ideas and cultures to the table. We, we hopefully all accept that. I'm here to tell you that you can't be a super successful law enforcement and intelligence agency if you don't look like the society you're trying to protect. So, you know, a couple of white guys driving around in a van is a surveillance operation. And so, you know, it doesn't, it, you don't blend in very well if you don't look like America and, and you, you don't develop informants and assets and get cooperation from America if you don't look like America. So the FBI is, is working extremely hard at trying to get the right people in the door who look like America and bring diversity to the table. But, you know, we just we just touched on a topic, Ellen, that that is one of the roadblocks there, which is asking talented, bright, young African-Americans to wear a badge right now. It's pretty damn hard. It's a marketing job. It's an ideology that has to be and a perception that has to be reversed. And it's extremely hard. And then, of course, it asks them to do it on a government salary when they can go to the corporate world. It, it's a challenge. But. They're working on it. There's also the a gender uh, disparity mm -hmm. in, in the FBI. It, they try diligently to raise the percentage of female agents, um, and it still isn't where they need it to be. And when you looked at, at the incidents of the last year or two, the, the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the, the great uh, controversy that has raised and, and the need for uh, or calls for police reform, uh, how do you, what do you think needs to be done? And not another, surely not another, just civilian review commission, right? What, what, how do we really move ahead on this issue? So first, let me say this, and I've said this before, the, the, the mantra of uh, defund the police is perhaps the worst public relations motto I've ever heard. Um, what the phrase that I use is reimagine the police. Hmm. Reimagine the police as as being what your community needs them to be. And part of that absolutely comes down to funding a different way of policing. And here's what I mean. My FBI career took me all over the United States. United States. You mentioned it, San Francisco as well, um, and, and Miami and Atlanta and Washington and Cleveland. I had an opportunity to work and partner with police departments around the country and I have to tell you, so much of this comes down to the bottom line of budget. By that, I mean, you, you want to recruit and screen candidates who are less prone to default to violence, who are less prone to respond in a racist manner, who can prove that they actually have true friends who are members of groups that don't look like them. That is expensive. You're talking about psychological screening, testing, um, and you're talking about engaging members of the public in the interview panels. Progressive departments do this, by the way. Get, the, get citizen activists to do the interviews and panels of police applicants. And then the training takes money. I worked in one city, Ellen, where the chief of police came to me and said, did I have any extra ammunition in my vault to give to the police department because their bullets were stale and didn't go bang on the firearms range. Mm -hmm. That's that's how poor this city was. And of course, we, we help them, but you get what you pay for in a police department. If you want to train people to not shoot, right? The FBI training spends as much time teaching you how to shoot accurately as when not to shoot, how to de-escalate verbally, and, and, and something called shooter restraint as well. So that takes extra money, extra training. I don't see cities funding that with police departments. Oh gosh, okay. I'd like to uh, touch a little bit on uh, on Russia investigation. You, you headed up counterintelligence uh, for some time too. So this is right in your wheelhouse. The FBI took a beating particularly from Republican allies of President Trump for its investigation of Russian interference and Russian links to Trump associates. Was the investigation founded? Did the Bureau handle it in an appropriate way following the seven C's? And then overall, has political partisanship affected FBI processes? A yep. yep. couple of different questions there. One, 
was it open properly and predicated properly? Thankfully, we have an inspector general DOJ report that says just that. It says the, the inquiry was properly predicated. Look, if nothing else, FBI agents are trained to identify and respond to threats. And the folks who opened that investigation, they were responding to the threat of their intelligent intelligence, some of it classified at a high level, that the Russians may have penetrated the campaign of a presidential candidate. It was properly predicated. But your next question was, was it properly worked? And the question, the question there is, um, mistakes were made with errors in judgment. So I came out publicly, and when Peter Strzok uh, and his emails, Peter Strzok was an, a senior executive in counterintelligence who actually ran the early days of the Russia inquiry into the campaign. When I saw the emails and texts that were coming out between him and FBI lawyer Lisa Page, and you I, were out by then, you had left the bureau, so you were. Not oh, there. yeah, absolutely. I was on TV one day, and I said you know, he's going, he's going to get fired. And I got, I got scorched in my social media. <laughs> don't speak ill of anybody who's investigating the president. And I, I said, no, you don't understand. And, and this is, this is my book. You don't understand. I'm preserving the FBI. I'm preserving the mission and the core values and the public's perception of the Bureau. He's going to get walked out of the building because you can't run the largest, the most serious investigation in FBI history and then in your off time, start tweeting about how you can't stand the subject of the investigation or he can't be president. Um, that, that conduct from a senior executive can't stand. So good investigation, solidly uh, investigated, horrific perception um, that's hurt the Bureau. And, and then, you know, Jim Comey also handed the president an excuse to hammer the Bureau and to fire him. This is mostly about Trump, but Comey and Strzok didn't help. You are referring to Comey's uh, press conference uh, in what, July of 2016 when he cleared uh, Hillary Clinton and then, but then criticized her handling of the servers and security, and then reopening the investigation later, and, and then closing it again on the eve of the election because right. quote we didn't find anything new here. Yeah, look, I knew that moment, and I and I I was texting with people in the bureau at the time. I'll never forget the press conference, the flags draped behind Jim Comey, by the way, who is a man of outstanding integrity and good intentions. I please don't misunderstand me, but I write about this in the book because it's part of the seven C's of credibility and consequences. And so he, in that moment at that press conference, many of us cringed and realized in that very moment he had politicized the FBI in the eyes of much of the public mm -hmm. by, by doing a couple of things. One, he forgot about accountability to the attorney general, and he forgot about preserving the perception of the FBI and didn't think three, four steps ahead about the damage it was going to do to the institution. And in fact, it did. And in fact, we saw him fired for political reasons, which politicized the FBI even more. Yeah. And then, you know, but on balance, the investigation did reveal a significant effort by the Russians to interfere. We shouldn't lose sight of that. Do you feel that the U.S. government responded? I guess it would be in the Trump administration responded with the appropriate level of uh, seriousness. Or did the topic become so politicized that it was impossible to deal effectively with a legitimate national security threat issue. Yeah, we're so polarized and we're sitting in echo chambers and we get our news from only one source. And so no one really understands the gravity of what happened. And very few Americans have read all 400 pages of the Mueller report. Um, and don't forget, we had an attorney general, Bill Barr, who decided to get out in front of this, um, pull the rug out from under special counsel Mueller and issue a four page summary and have a press conference where he decided to spin this um, and the findings completely in a fabricated fashion. No, no obstruction, um, no collusion, and that's not true. Um, there was no criminal conspiracy found. There were 10 examples of obstruction of justice by the president provided by Mueller. Mueller was playing by the rules, meaning there's a DOJ memo that says you really shouldn't indict a sitting president. That governed his approach. Bill Barr came out and said, nothing criminal here. We can't do anything. I urge people, if you, if you really have problems with the special counsel, I urge people to read the GOP-controlled Senate intelligence report that is even more damning 
It's more damning than the special counsel report. It says that Paul Manafort, the chairman of the campaign, had an, it had a Russian intelligence officer as his deputy. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Now, um, Christopher Wray has taken over from Comey uh, as the director of the FBI. He took over at a turbulent time. How do you assess Director Wray's stewardship of the FBI? And then just recently, uh, President Biden said he'd keep Director Ray on, uh, you know, not replace him. What do you think of that move? What do, what's the signal it sends and do you approve? Yeah. So let's start with keeping mm-hmm. Ray on. I am a huge fan of the 10-year term for an FBI director. There's a reason why some very smart people decades ago said, you know what? The FBI must remain neutral and non-political, we can't change out the FBI director every time there's a new president because it will politicize the the law enforcement and intelligence agency that that we need to protect us. So um, absolutely, he deserves to finish out his his term and he's got six more years left. Now, with regard to his tenure so far, I heard a lot of people saying things like, "Uh, I'm disappointed in Ray, where was he at a press conference right after the insurrection? Why hasn't he called out the president? Etc. I want to. I want to. Let's let's go back and recap some of this. FBI Director Ray has testified on the Hill at least twice, where he's clearly articulated that domestic terrorism is the number one threat facing America, and 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 then he said there's a subset within that that is hate-based violence that incurred the wrath of President Trump. And from that point on, Ray was simply trying to survive while running the FBI because he knew Mm -hmm. that the alternative was to have, say, an acting assist uh, director who might have the name Rudy Giuliani or Sidney Powell, which would be a disaster for national security. So he's both trying to do the right thing and run the organization, and he's trying to survive while he's doing it. The the idea that he should have come out immediately after the insurrection and said, what, I'm in charge when I've got this, Um, it it, it further increases the risk he'd be fired in the middle of a national crisis. It had nothing to do with him running the actual investigation. And it's quite likely that acting A.G. Rosen um, and or the White House had told him you show up behind a podium, you're canned. We're, mm. putting our, we're putting our own person in as director during the crisis. I have to say, I my gut told me that was happening the minute I saw the press say, stand by a DOJ and FBI press conference on the insurrection is about to occur. And I turn on the television and they sent the guys from the field. They sent the head of the Washington field office. They sent the U.S. attorney from D.C. In that second, I went, there is a problem. He's getting gagged. Mm. Well, uh, I wanted to turn to another related issue of with the Bureau. It's in the wake of September 11th, some have called, some called for splitting the FBI British style into two organizations, one that would handle criminal investigations and one like MI5 that would handle intelligence and counter terrorism and counter espionage issues. Would that be a good idea here in the States? Yeah, I, I have a strong opinion on this, and I address it. I felt so strongly about it. I felt the need to address it in the last couple of chapters in my book. Mm-hmm. Um, I have had people approach me already and say, yep, that's it. Um, FBI uh, should handle just law enforcement. Let's create a separate domestic security agency to spy on Americans and stop this threat. And I, and I say, okay, go have a beer with someone at MI5. Or, or the Metropolitan Police in the UK, or closer to home, go north to Canada and sit down with RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, and ask them how their systems work. They've got a wall up like we had um, before 9-11. And literally, I tell the story in the book, my own experience, of, of having a serious espionage case where CSIS could literally not tell the RCMP what was going on and the delays and hemorrhaging and damage that was done because each agency had to separately investigate it, couldn't talk to each other, and the FBI had to intervene. And I became the the official who told the RCMP, uh, you have a spy, 
your buddies over here can't tell you, but you have a spy. So this does not work. The seamlessness and the speed with which we need to address the threat only happens when an agency is wearing both hats, law enforcement, power of arrest, and intelligence. The FBI is that agency. And throughout my career, Ellen, I've seen examples of drug agents in the FBI who pick up intel from an informant that a Middle Eastern terrorist is trying to get across the border, that a, a cartel is shipping weapons to support a terror organization. You don't have that happen unless you have seamless um, um, relations between in, within one agency, between the criminal agents and the national security agents sitting squad to squad in the same building. We didn't learn anything from 9-11. I mean, that's one of these issues, right? It's tearing down those walls. We tore, tore down the wall between Intel and law enforcement and then even within law enforcement agencies, you can't have and, that. Wall. And it's harder to connect the proverbial dots if you aren't, right. if you aren't under one roof sitting together. Yeah. So um, we're getting a number of really interesting questions. And one of someone from the audience also just brought up a question that I would, wanted to ask you is you, you may have heard today that the, the Proud Boy leader Enrique Tario once was an FBI informant. Uh, Questioner asked, what's the deal on, on that? Uh, came out in a, did you see that? Came out in a, um, in an interview and there was a uh, affidavit that said, Back in 2014, the FBI had used him as an informant in some um, fraud cases. Uh, he's, I believe, you know, denying that. But what do you make of someone like a Proud Boy leader having actually been an informant for the FBI in the past? I mean, is that a level of cynicism? That, you know, well, so first, Ellen, like, you, like, you, you, I, I have to ask you, have you seen the reporting? I have, I have not. I, I'm, I'm reading just, yes, it, it came out today in Reuters and okay. other um, news organizations. All right. So, so not, not having read it, let me just say this. Mm -hmm. um, and it should, it should resonate with folks. FBI informants are not Sunday school teachers. FBI informants are bad actors. And so the, the notion that, what, six or seven years ago, mm -hmm. um, a Proud Boys leader would have provided criminal information to the FBI about something? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, drug drug dealers, you know, pimps, um, terrorists. I I've I had a terrorist as an informant when I was an agent. Shouldn't surprise anybody. We got some great stuff about terrorism from it. So um, I want to know more about what happened next. Um, if it's true that he was a valid, opened, you know, yeah. we have a file on you informant. Um, when did that stop? When did that relationship break off? Right. Far more newsworthy if we found out he was an informant two months ago. Far more newsworthy. Yes. But let me let, let me say this. And, and to the extent that it's breaking news here, here's your scoop. You know that he was arrested in the District of Columbia before the insurrection right. for burning a sign and taking a Black Lives Matter banner, taking a Black Lives Matter off a sign off a church in D.C. and burning it. And and overtly, who did the arrest? the Washington, D.C. Metro Police Department, who actually orchestrated that arrest, the FBI. So if anybody wants to say that somehow the FBI was cozy with, uh, you know, seven years ago with uh, with a bad guy, uh, maybe, but they got him arrested in D.C. How uh, successful has the Bureau been at placing informants or undercovers within these domestic uh, far-right groups and white supremacist groups, and um, what do you think of that as a you know tool to to to, to prevent violence, to detect, prevent, you know, make cases? Yeah, you're so you're you're getting very close to to home for me. Th this is my point: is that they're constrained severely from doing this, and and sometimes for very valid reasons. I I don't want an FBI informant in my backyard barbecue because I'm talking about how I don't like a particular politician, right? No one wants that. But the, there's, there's, there's a problem with that because when my backyard barbecue turns into militia training with weapons in the woods, mm -hmm. and now my buddies start talking about hurting somebody, the problem is the FBI has no way of getting in there until something really bad is about to happen and some bad guy raises their hand and look at the look at the plot to kidnap um, Governor Whitmer in um, in Michigan. Michigan. 
How did that in part come to be found? One of the militia members raised his hand to law enforcement and said, hey, um, you're not going to believe this, but even I'm worried about these guys. They're talking about killing cops and, and kidnapping the governor. This is bad. So we're at the point, Ellen, where we have to rely on bad guys to come forward and say they're scared of somebody. So we, we've got to find the happy medium here. Yeah. Can we look at social media posts, though, and, and look for uh, indications of plotting and planning of violence and then use that as the uh, predication for an investigation where you can then, you know, try to place under covers or or get surveillance? So, so I say this. If, if it's discovered that, that a chat room or a, a group or conversation is primarily about violence or that even one person is clearly moving the group toward violence, I'm all for law, uh, rules and regulations that allow the FBI to get in there. But right now, it's extremely difficult. And again, ask yourself, um, do the American people, are, are, do they want, are they comfortable with the FBI just kind of wholesale monitoring social media posts. First of all, the resources aren't there. The, the civil liberties free speech issues are huge with that. And I and I say, um, don't go so far back in history. Go back to 9-11. Go back to the Patriot Act. And remember that the FBI and other agencies were collecting what was called metadata on phone records. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this is this is not even close to monitoring your social media posts. This is just getting your phone bill. Right. The FBI was collecting your phone bills from everybody just to store them so that someday if a terrorist dialed a number, they could go, whoa, you that guy called that number six months ago. There's right. there's a problem or we get our hands on a terrorist telephone number. and We find that Frank Figluzzi called that two years ago. Congress stepped in and said, we don't like that. Very uncomfortable if you're what you're collecting phone records. OK, so now what are we suggesting? The FBI should watch all social media. How come they didn't catch these guys? OK, are you really comfortable with that? Right. So we've got a question from the audience asking what type of charges could come out of the Capitol incident? Should we expect more charges and how does the timing of current political events factor in? So. Um, good news. I've, I've in the last 24 hours, we've seen clear indications from the U.S. Attorney's Office right. that we're we should expect to see much more serious sedition charges. Um, that's fantastic against the organizers, the planners, the most violent amongst the insurrectionists. That's encouraging. We've all we're already approaching almost 200 arrests by the FBI on people in that building. Also, I see the debate going on right now, right? We're hearing word that lots of U.S. attorney's offices are saying, don't don't know if we have the resources to, to, to charge trespass to a thousand people. Don't know if it's effective to do it. Wouldn't you rather spend your resources on building the sedition case, the conspiracy case against the leaders of this, as right. opposed to people who wandered in to the building and wondered how they got in? So I, I understand that. That's a healthy debate. Um, resources and 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 complex investigative charges are where we should be going with that. How how do you feel about um, you know just addressing the actual root causes of this sort of you know, hate based uh, domestic violent extremism, especially that of you know the white supremacists or on the far right? What how do we go about identifying and and then addressing those root causes? This is complicated. We didn't get here overnight. I will say that we even didn't get here in just the last four years. I will say this. The last year, the last four years was a radicalization process on steroids, but it didn't start just four years ago. It started clearly back during the Obama administration when we saw record threats against a first black president, but it started way before that. Racism and hate is is woven through the fabric, unfortunately. Of our society, so it won't be solved overnight. But I will say this: a couple of things. Um, it's a all hands on desk, deck, holistic approach that's needed. Law enforcement is not just the sole solution to this in any way. Um, people have been radicalized, and now there's a two edged sword about silencing platforms, taking parlor down. Um, silencing the president, which I'm an advocate for, but let's understand the flip side of this. 
you may be forcing extremists into further into dark recesses of the internet. They are now migrating to encrypted platforms where law enforcement cannot see them and where they may have had guardrails and, and people saying, hey, Uncle Joe, I saw that Facebook post. You are crazy. Stop that. Now yeah. Uncle Joe has no guardrails and all he's hearing is more Uncle Joe's talking about violence. So this is all hands on deck. A kind of de-radicalization process has to occur. The Biden administration has got to put that in place. Some of it involves two things, exposing them to sunshine, truth, 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 mm-hmm. harder, harder to do when they're buried on only one news source. And then secondly, showing them there are personal benefits to thinking differently. By that, I mean, you may not have voted for me, Joe Biden, but does your kid need college? Would you like a break on tuition costs? Does someone in your child have health care problems that I can help fix with a health care plan? Would you like to stop being a coal miner and maybe get trained on building wind turbines? I can do that for you. If you hit them personally, hit them on the budget of their household and show them some light, you may start a de-radicalization process. Interesting. Uh, Do you see any links or do you have any concerns about the degree to which foreign states might be supporting uh, some of these violent extremists here or domestic groups in Europe might be making common cause with these here? What, what, What do you think? Yeah, I this is this is what I I headed up in the FBI was the foreign threat. And let me tell you something. Vladimir Putin was a winner in this last election, a winner for the last four years, sowing discord and chaos. That's his number one goal. Our adversaries and we do have adversaries want to see us in total chaos and disarray. And and we're pretty much there. And so I am convinced that there was some funding uh, look, we Bob Mueller indicted 24 Russians, including 12 card-carrying GRU intelligence officers for hacking and social media propaganda. They're messing with us. They're still messing with us. And the FBI has conceded that it has an open investigation now into a thing like um, half a million dollars in Bitcoin being transferred to some far-right extremist leaders just before the insurrection, where did that come from? It was foreign. It was foreign based. And larger, they have the U.S. Attorney in D.C. has conceded he slipped up during a press conference and said, "Yep, we're we've opened a counterterrorism case, and we're treating you know we also have opened a counterintelligence case." And I that that got my intent. That got my attention. You you've did you've done what? You've opened a counterintelligence case into the insurrection. There there's something going on there. Explain to our, our audience what that means to you. Why why is that a? Um, yeah, it means it, it means they have reason to believe that there is some foreign adversary that may have had something to do with either fomenting, inciting, and or funding mm-hmm. or being present at the insurrection. And and wouldn't it wouldn't it be ironic if the people who 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 pulled off the insurrection, thinking that they were true patriots of America, actually had been duped and led to do it by an American adversary? Wouldn't wouldn't that be something? It wouldn't have been the first time either, right? Neither. No, indeed, no, in, <laughs> indeed. And and look, we had look at one at one point, Ellen. In the last four years, a quarter million people were following fabricated Russian intelligence accounts on Facebook. Accounts telling you how to vote, how to think, who to hate. Mm. That's our adversary. What I also hear is that, you know, the Russians are kind of uh, equal opportunity um, discord uh, set sellers. I mean, here they, you know, maybe they, they, they've distributed or uh, amplified far right uh, ideology, but they've also done that on the left. And they've done that over the years they, during the Cold War, the Soviets did that. So can you talk a little bit about, about that aspect as well of, you know, yeah, when I talk when I talk to people who say, "Look, I'm I'm okay with Putin and Russia because they supported my guy Trump," mm-hmm. I, I I I see that as a teachable moment. I, I I then explain to them, it's not it's not about the how much they're with Trump. It's about how much they hate us as America and want to mess with us. And in a heartbeat, they will turn on a candidate and pick some other guy or gal. So yeah. don't don't think for a minute. 
that they're supporting, quote, your guy, and that makes it okay. Um, At some point, uh, they also supported Bernie, I, I, we reported. Well, yeah, yes, you did. Yes, yes, you did. So every we, we have to have, this gets to another point in my book, Ellen, and I know we don't have time, but I, I expl- explain in the book that never before had we had to vet a presidential candidate as a potential national security threat. And I point out how the FBI spends more time vetting and background screening some a barista in the FBI headquarters coffee shop mm. who gets a top secret clearance, by the way, than we do vetting a candidate for high office. And it's time to rethink how we vet a candidate. And I explain in never before released um, uh, cleared information from FBI headquarters in that same chapter, this isn't just at the president level. As, as an FBI assistant director, I had to confront a sitting member of Congress at the time and tell him a foreign adversary considers you to be a snitch, considers you to be their asset. Do you understand what I'm telling you? The threat is at all levels, and we don't vet our candidates as national security threats. We can start by demanding tax returns, financial disclosures, and mm. foreign business entanglements. Great. So if we only have a few minutes left, I want to get to some of these questions. Um, one here says, do you see evidence that the new administration offers a chance to restore some of our democracy and work together with the intelligence community? Well, I already see evidence of that because I see true professionals with actual resumes being named to mm-hmm. certain positions at state, at DHS, um, in the cyber world, at the Pentagon, um, at DOJ. So I'm refreshed. And then, of course, we've already talked about how Biden intends to keep Chris Ray on for a 10 year term. This is very, very refreshing. And people ask me, how can the intelligence community and the FBI restore its its stature and its place and its and and I say, here's here's number one way to do it. The White House can stay the hell out of the way of the career professionals who yeah. simply come to work every day trying to protect America. A lot of people think that the intelligence community is watching every move we citizens make. Is there any truth to these concerns? All right. So I think we've just discussed this, which is. Um, everybody asking the question after the insurrection, why why isn't the intelligence community monitoring everything we do? Why why didn't they catch this? And the answer is because they can't. They can't legally. They can't for, because of the resources. And I would never suggest that they should do that. I want to live in a de- free and open democracy with free right. speech. So the answer is no. Look, the FBI people people think the FBI is this massive organization. And here's what I say to that: the New York Police Department, NYPD has 35,000 sworn officers. The FBI has 12,000 gun and badge carrying agents. So NYPD covers the five boroughs of New York with 35,000 gun and badge cops. The FBI covers the world with 60 officers overseas, by the way, with 12,000 gun and badge people. Um, Please don't please don't suggest that the FBI is capable of reading everybody's emails or social media posts. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, the NYPD may even have, uh, they, they probably have more intel agents, right, than the FBI? Uh, the the NYPD has an impressive intelligence division um, that collects without all of the necessary laws that the FBI necessarily has to play by as part of DOJ. So it's quite the infrastructure. And NYPD has offices overseas. A lot of mm-hmm. people don't know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so there actually are differing standards for, uh, for 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 surveillance and for collection at the national federal level than there are at state. And okay, very true. All right, one more question: Can you comment on how the FBI decides when to end an investigation and issue its indictments if there are loose ends with others who could be indicted? Do they wait so as not to tip their hand? Yeah. Yeah. So, so real quick, this is a real um, issue, not just on the criminal side of the FBI, but on the national security side, which is a serious concern. At what point do you say the threat has become so real that we need to move now on the people we've identified at the risk of not wrapping up an entire cell of terrorists or spies? A very serious question. Now, with regard to prosecuting criminal cases and, and getting indictments, 
the U.S. Attorney's Office, the prosecutors actually actually help run that decision and say it's time to move into in, into indictment and and put handcuffs on people. But it's the same working a drug cartel, working a, a, a cell of terrorists, working a cell of spies. When do you pull the trigger? When is enough enough? When can you keep going? I will say this on the national security side, the goal is never just handcuffs, never. On the espionage side, it may never result in criminal mm-hmm. charges. It has to involve identifying the cell and neutralizing and deterring the cell. That's the success metric. Great. So uh, last question, I guess, is uh, goes to trust in the FBI. How have the events of the last four years affected the level of trust and confidence the American public has in the FBI? You spoke about that somewhat earlier, but ha- has that changed, do you think, vis-a-vis the past 20 years since 9-11? And what's your your prognosis for you know going forward here, Frank? Yeah, the, the reality is the FBI lives and dies by its brand and its reputation. And that comes down to what have you done for me lately? Or how have you screwed up lately? That I mean, it, it's just a minute by minute situation. I can tell you this, during the last four years, we didn't have the White House come out and praise the FBI about any of the terrorist acts it disrupted, right? Major sex rings taken down, child exploitation, nothing. And I'm hoping we're going to see more of that in the open so the FBI can go, wow, they do great work on a daily basis. Because all you hear about on the front page is when the FBI screws up. When they succeed, it's on the back page. Frank, do you, do you have any last words or closing thoughts for, for audience in the minute? Yeah, real, real quick, mm-hmm. real quick before I join Nicole Wallace on MSNBC in two minutes. Um, <laughs> and that And that is... I chose as my last chapter in the book, the last of the seven C's, something called consistency. And I Mm -hmm. chose that because so many people are wondering, how do we get through what we've just been through? Is there some other way we should be looking at our government, our democracy? And I say this, the FBI faces unprecedented stress every single day, and they do it by not abandoning their core values, but rather by clinging to them, their training, their protocols, their code. If we do that as a nation, If we cling to the rule of law, the Constitution, three equal branches of government, we will get through this. Just give it time and be that conservator of the nation's core values. Well, our thanks to you, Frank, author of the new book, The FBI Way, Inside the Bureau's Code of Excellence, for joining us today. Um, And also thank you to our audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Ellen Nakashima. Thank you and stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Ellen. Take care, everybody.